I started working in the White House in 2013. It was shortly after President Barack Obama had won his second term in office. And I had a job that was called an outreach director. I was an advisor to Vice President Biden, and I spoke to different groups on behalf of the White House. And one of the groups that I spoke to was the labor union community. Not all, but a lot of the people that I worked with were like stereotypical labor dudes, right? They're big and they're burly and a little bit gruff. And sometime early in my time at the White House, the vice president, Vice President Biden, was on the phone with one of these labor leaders. And he checked in and asked him how I was doing. And this labor leader says, oh, Carrie, oh, she's great, she's straightforward, she knows her stuff. I'm still getting used to all that hair, but she's good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was good at that job, and I loved that job, not just because I was earnest and hardworking, because I believed in American service, which I do, but because of how I constructed my identity, and because I knew that you could be a big, gruff labor leader, and we would still have a lot in common. And that's what I want to talk to you all about today. I want to talk about our identities and how we shape them. And I want to talk about what that means for the future of this country. So I am the daughter of two parents who have really kind of typical American stories, but in different ways. My mom is a daughter of the American Revolution. I am a descendant of a signer of the Declaration of Independence. The town that she grew up in, a small rural Ohio town, was not only founded by, but it was named after her family. My father is an immigrant. He grew up, he was born and raised on a small island in the Caribbean, and he was basically forced here in his 20s by his grandmother. He was smart, he is smart, uh, hardworking, earnest, diligent, and she knew that he would thrive if he were exposed to the kind of opportunities that this country promised. So 10 years later, my parents meet. Uh, they're in night class at a university in Columbus, a civics lesson, perhaps foreshadowing uh, the interest of one of their future children. And they get together, we have a happy little family, mom, dad, my older brother, my older sister, and I. And I grew up in a kind of classic suburb. Upper middle class, well-to-do, you leave your bike in the front yard, the front door is never locked. You have a community of energetic citizens who have high expectations for the young people who, who grew up there. It's great. It's an incredibly privileged type of way and place to grow up. And I loved it, with the exception of one very huge way that it failed. It was completely lacking in diversity. And in addition to making me and our family kind of the odd family out, it also just wasn't keeping pace with where the country is headed. In 2040, somewhere around there, America is going to be a country that, has, that its citizens are majority non-white. In 2050 or somewhere around there, over a quarter of the population of Americans will be multiracial or biracial. The youngest generation of Americans currently is the most diverse, the most tolerant, and the largest generation of Americans ever. And this is a really radical social change for our country to undertake. And if you're a student of history, you know that periods of rapid social change are often periods of intense violence. It's really tempting to think that old people with old views are going to die off and that the young people will save us. Uh, but I will remind you that those were young men and women in Charlottesville. And so if we want to have the type of country that lives up to its ideals, if we want to be the type of Americans that embody the creed of this country, then we have a lot of work to do. We have to do it together. And there's three things that we all can do. And I, I've had to go through these processes myself, so I will assure you that, you that it is possible and we can do it. So the first thing we have to do is we have to identify our bias. Everyone has bias. I have built in diversity and I've had to unlearn my bias. <laughs> like I should have been, you know, way ahead of the curve, but I wasn't. Uh, so we have to identify that we all have bias. It's a legacy of the history of this country. An implicit bias, just as a refresher, implicit bias is the set of values and opinions and assumptions you have of other people who are different than you that you've absorbed passively, that you've learned from society, that you've 
picked up in the, from the media or from the coded language of politicians. It's something you're unconscious of, but I, we all have it. It's some combination of isms and phobias that help paint our view and our reactions to other people. And so the process of undoing your bias, it can be challenging and hurtful. I assure you it is also embarrassing, uh, but we have to do it. There's a thing called the Harvard Implicit Bias Test, and when you take it, it'll help you to understand what your biases are and how they're aligned. I've taken it. I didn't do so hot on my first pass, which is humiliating to admit, but it's true. I nailed it the second time. Uh, <laughs> and it'll help you to start unpacking all the things that you have to unlearn. Now, I'll tell a story to help illustrate bias. I've always been really sure and quick to push back on stereotypes. I've always condemned any sort of offensive language. But it's not the overt stuff that really is per so pernicious. A lot of times it's the subtle stuff. So I was in college, I was in my 20s, and I was at a dinner party. And again, I grew up in an all-white, not all-white, predominantly white town. And I'm at a dinner party in college, feeling very sophisticated, I'm sure. <laughs> and I was just <laughs> chatting up, uh, I was chatting up a handsome Latino man, and he told me that he was a medical resident. And I looked at him, I go, doctor, <laughs> good for you, amazing. <laughs> and he looked at me with a combination of fury and humiliation, and also a certain, like, A2, brown girl, like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and his reaction was spot on. I would have reacted the same way, and I often do, when people register surprise that I've accomplished things or that I've achieved. But that was a function of my bias. I was in my 20s before I met a Latino doctor. I, didn't, I knew they existed, but to me it was remarkable. And it's not. It wasn't. And I offended him because I had not taken the time to assess the bias and the assumptions that I made about a different group of people that I had not been very exposed to. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to recognize that we all have a problem, because <laughs> we do. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to try to fix it. And that requires us to change our habits. It requires us to go to different places, talk to different people, visit a house of worship of a different faith than you, sit and listen and learn. Intentionally expose yourself to different ideas and different people with the express purpose of learning. You do not know what you think you do. I assure you, you don't. And again, I have a little story. So I was maybe one of two or three black kids in my school of over 2,000. And because I like being good at things, by the time I was a teenager, I was convinced I was the blackest person in America. <laughs> <laughs> and because none of my friends knew any better, they were convinced too, right? <laughs> Got big hair, I'm a great dancer, I know all the music, I know the artist, I knew my history backwards and forwards. And so I go to college, I was very excited. I was going to finally hang out with black kids in mass. It was going to be amazing. And because I am the blackest person in Ohio, we were all going to get along great, right? <laughs> it was going to be like straight out of a movie until I actually get there. And I bore the unmistakable signs of someone who's not actually spent much time with black kids. I missed every social cue. I couldn't understand cultural references. I am not, it turns out, a very good dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a hard one. That was, that was tough to give up. <laughs> and I probably said silly things like, no, 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 I have a bunch of black friends. No, 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 I've, you know, I probably did all of those faux pas. And so imagine being that bewildered if I didn't know the things I thought I knew about the group of people that I thought I belonged to, what did, could I possibly know about anybody else? I assure you, you do not know what you think you do. So one, we're gonna identify that we have bias. 
And two, we're going to start fixing it. And that requires humility and that requires listening and that requires us to stretch ourselves and to be uncomfortable. The third thing we're going to do is we're going to be really graceful and patient. If you go about the process of undoing your bias and you do it earnestly and honestly, you are going to say the wrong thing. You are going to say something that perhaps hurts someone, that confuses someone. If you're going to help someone through this process, they are going to say something that hurts you, that confuses you. We have to have space and we have to have grace to have these conversations. That doesn't mean say whatever you want. Doesn't mean speak carelessly. Words are powerful. They are our, our most powerful tool. We have to use our language compassionately. But we have to be able to try, we have to be able to figure it out. Learning about other people is an indelicate process. It is incredibly important that we undertake these three steps if we are going to be responsible inheritors of this country's future. I have spent my entire adult life in service to this country and its ideals and its values. I believe that we can be a country that is, that is who we say we are. We have a lot of work to do and we have to do it together. We will be better, you will be better, our families, our communities, our country will be better if we do this work. Thank you. <laughs>